Hot Pop Mumbles, I got a very important job for you. You can count on us, big boy. Hurry, I got one. What did he say? He said, what's the job, boss? Welcome to your Walt Disney World dream vacation. You know, there's a lot to do here. So you're thinking, hmm, what to do first? How about watch this show? <laughs> hear ye, hear ye! The Royal Ball is about to begin! <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, come with us to a world of joyous songs and wondrous miracles. W, w Radio, your information station. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 373 for the week of August 17th, 2014. I'm here to help you have the best possible Disney vacation experience and bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are with this podcast, videos, blog, live broadcasts, special events, my trivia books, 102 ways to save money for and at Walt Disney World, audio tours, and so much more. You can find everything over at www.radio.com. So this week, I want to share with you our live show recording from our WDW Radio Neverland and Sea event at the Atlantic Dance Hall right before our cruise on the Disney Dream last week. We discuss everything from Walt Disney World marathons to Star Wars and some other possible theme park expansions, Avatar, Frozen, Marvel, possible existing attraction updates, while we use a little armchair imagineering, and we'll also talk about our top 10 Disney characters. Oh, and I also reveal what is 103. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World trivia question of the week and pose a new challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Then be sure and stay tuned to the end of the show because I'll have some updates and announcements, including information about some upcoming events and something new I'm offering for my fellow podcasters. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. So I want to welcome everybody to the first sort of annual, hopefully, WDW Radio Never Land and Sea event. Let's hear it from everybody in the audience. You guys having fun today? Who liked apples to apples? Who liked ABC? Not by the Jackson 5, but the other ABC. More importantly, who enjoyed the food? Try the sausage, tip your waiters and waitresses. I'll be here all week. Uh, I want to thank you guys for being here again. Thanks to everybody who helped put this together. Thanks for Becky from Mouse Fan Travel for sponsoring today's event. Give it up. And for joining me here. Literally, we are literally for the first time at a round table. We, you're right. Hey, it's nice to be here at the round table. Usually our tables are 2,000 miles apart, separated by Skype. Or we're sitting, eating somewhere. Pretty much. <laughs> That's pretty much the extent of our relationship. Eating and Skyping. And, and but usually that. it's a, a garbage can and not quite such a lovely dress table. There is something to be said about a corn dog on Main Street in Disneyland atop a garbage can. Um, you, you laugh until you try it and then tell me it's not a magical experience. Much like the cozy cone at... Uh, <gasps> Food in a cone. I can't wait to go back. I know. I can't wait to go back. We're close. We're getting close. Who's, um, who is actually going to Disneyland anytime soon? By a show of hands. And, uh, and you two freaks in the front are going because you're going to run the marathon, aren't you? Avengers. And, right, and you can't make fun of it because it's the Avengers. Like, I think it actually, I think the Avengers marathon actually made non-runners go, you know, maybe I want to go and run this. Because yeah. of the really cool metal. Did you see the metal? I, it's a spinner, and oh. it's got all kind. Of, yeah, like yeah. go just for the metal. And remember, the guy who comes in last gets the exact same metal as the guy who comes in first. I'm just saying, there's no, 
your medal is not any more special if you run faster. You know, they're really doing some interesting things with these races between Avengers and then the Star Wars race that came out right beyond it. And then, of course, they're doing a race from Castaway Key from the uh, ship sailing right after the marathon. So running's becoming a thing. I think you should get more into that. I am uh, I am registered for at least one of the Avengers races. Which one? I will neither confirm nor deny Come what on. I will or we... Nobody's Listen, listening. You no matter what, me. I will be there to help cheer you on. I promise you. I'll be there on the sidelines, probably with food in my hand, but I will be there with you in spirit. Will you have a utility belt again? Because that was pretty cool. Yeah, that the utility belt that I wore during the 5K, and, and I do the 5Ks at Walt Disney World now because I want all of you who are here and who are listening to be able to participate in what has become an amazing event. It's not about the running anymore, right? It's about the community. It's about the friendships. It's about the experience. And I think that uh, a half marathon is sort of a, a deep water to sort of dip your toe in if you've never run before, especially yeah. for people with little legs like me. So we could all do the 5K. We walk it. And I said, we'll eat along the way, and I'll have sort of food. And somebody made me a utility belt that has something for donuts and a chip clip for Doritos and Twizzlers. And uh, heavy as it was, I was very popular because I was feeding people along the way. It, it was utilized. It definitely was used, that's for sure. It was like a little Batman utility belt. And, well, and like you said, the 5Ks especially, because it, it really intimidated me when you hear the word 5K and you've never done one That's because we don't use the metric system. Like, who calls it a 5K? <laughs> Call it a, uh, what, is it, what is it in miles? It's like 3.1. 3. 3.1. 3. 1. 3. 1. Yeah. But it's really, it's, it's easy to do if you're not having to run you it full force. That, you can walk you it walk fast, that yeah. A little bit less than that in World Showcase. Yeah, we, we did, we've done it, what, two years in a row now, taking, doing it together as a group, and it works really well, and everybody's invited to join along, and it's not as intimidating as it sounds. Anybody, would anybody like to sort of do these events? Forget the fear of getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning, but think that maybe a half marathon is too much. It's okay, don't. You should, Darlene, come out and do the 5K with us. I promise you, I will tell you something. If you can't finish, I will carry you, push you, walk with you, jog with you, whatever it may be. I will feed you along the way so you cross that finish line and get the cool medal. And I put that offer out to anybody that wants to come out because it is that much fun. Yeah, it really is. And it's harder to cheer than it is to run. <laughs> <laughs> no one understands really how hard it is to cheer I can't complain. Getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning four days in a row is borderline insanity. Yeah, and, not, and we don't get a medal for it. At least you guys get something at the you end of it. Bling. But hey, we get Egg McMuffins if we're lucky. If we have enough time to stop. And those Egg McMuffins, again, are usually, um, usually on a garbage can. Yeah. So... Uh, so I want to, today, I want to open it up to you who are here. If you guys have any questions you, that you want answered, we have a microphone down in front. Don't be shy. Just get up and come down. Ask me anything, Disney related. Ask me anything. I'm opening myself up here. But feel free to ask me anything, much like we do on this Wednesday could be nights. Good. Yeah. Um, but I actually wanted to, um, I've been saying all along, and, and this week's um, live show, who, who's, who joins me in the box on Wednesday nights, frequently or Ooh. infrequently? Why aren't you raising your hand? Why don't you people, why don't you watch it? There's nothing else on TV on Wednesday. <laughs> like there's Seinfeld reruns and I think that's about it. But you should watch every Wednesday. And this week, I, I really had a good time um, on this week's show because I was totally geeking out. Who, who's a geek, right? If you're here, right. If you're here, you're a geek. You, so you should all be raising your hands. Who's totally digging everything that's happening with Guardians of the Galaxy and Marvel and Star Wars and everything else. Yeah, a lot of hands are raised very enthusiastic. And so I think that recently it's been a very, like, it's been a good week for the geeks this week. Oh, yeah. Who has seen Guardians of the Galaxy? <laughs> Who plans on seeing it again? <laughs> Who hopes? Oh, sweet baby Jesus, please let Guardians of the Galaxy be playing on the Disney Dream this week because I'm so <laughs> desperate. I so very much want to see it again. But you want to talk about a movie that is just pure fun. It's completely enjoyable. I don't think any of us, unless you're a hardcore comic book fan, knew of these characters ahead of time. But you instantly fell in love with Rocket Raccoon or Groot or whoever it may be. And I think that the film not only did amazingly at the box office, right? So Bob Iger uh, had a sort of a, a shareholders call this week. The film cost $170 million to make. They made 160.4 in the first three days. Wow. Like, I, I think they're going to call, I think they'll be in the black on this one. <laughs> I, I think they're going to do okay. 
right? So the Disney earnings are through the roof. The company is just crushing it. Again, I think Bob Iger is just, he's solidifying his legacy in terms of acquisitions and expansions and growth. And then he goes on to say, oh, by the way, one more thing, uh, we're going to be building a star, he didn't really say what it was, but he sort of hinted at an attraction slash land based on Star Wars coming to an as yet unnamed Disney parks and collectively the geeks world's brains fall out of their head because <laughs> it's not that big of a revelation. I think we all sort of did the math and figured that Star Wars was coming, but like was anybody else really excited to, to kind of get that confirmation? Yeah. No, nobody yeah. cared. Nobody. The possibilities of that, I mean, okay, they came along with Avatar Land. We were thinking, you know, how beautiful that will be and, and visually, but the possibilities of Star Wars and where they can take that beyond just the, the ride that we have currently and Star Wars weekends that we have currently, there are so many places they can go, so many directions that they can take the concept. So, all right, let's play armchair Imagineers for a second. Mm -hmm. If they are going to build a Star Wars land slash attraction, where do you think it should go? Where do you think, where would you like it to go? Studios. The studios, mm -hmm. where? Anywhere. You just demolish the studios, they said, and just build Star Wars land. By where, Fifth Gates, where? Ooh. Probably near Star Tours. So what if, what if I said, and, and this is pure speculation, what if I said, okay, we're going to close down Backlot Express. We're going to close down Indiana Jones. Okay. We're going to blow out the back of that area where the parking lot is for cast members now, and we're going to build a Star Wars land. Yes. 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 Nobody objects. You, you have a question? You have raising your hand? Marion, could you bring her the mic? Go ahead. Karen K. Stoy in the box. Um, I just think if they do that, it's not going to mesh with the rest of the park. I think instead of doing that, they just need to relook at the park as a whole, especially after being to California for the first time and seeing California Adventure and what they've done with Cars Land. I think it would be a little short-sighted just to do one land, especially seeing what Frozen has done for us. So I'm not sure that I would totally 100% agree with that. So you're not sure about building a Star Wars-themed land at that park? As is right now. Although That's it correct. could, and, and I will tell you, the one thing I love about Cars Land is I think for the first time, look, if you look at anywhere in Walt Disney World, Fantasyland is sort of an amalgamation of a lot of different stories. Cars Land is that first land that when you step through that portal, you are inside that film. You are instantly transported to a single location inside a film that you can go back and watch the movie and see where you've been walking. Right? Fantasyland is sort of a lot of different stories. I think that they could do that with Star Wars. So the follow-up question is, if they were to build a Star Wars themed land, what part of the Star Wars universe should it be from? Wow. Should it be Tatooine? Should it be Coruscant? Should it be Naboo? Should it be the Death Star? The Mos Eisley Spaceport? Mos Eisley Spaceport. Please, just make the Backlot Express the Mos Eisley Cantina and yeah. let's just be done with it. Let's, yeah. that's, that's, we know we all want that. They could just play that one song in a continuous loop and nobody would care. <laughs> Blue Milk. In the, in the summer, probably not the best choice, but that's okay. We'll, we'll sort of work around that. Uh, I think that works. And look, even sort of continuing on with that, you know, I talked about the potential loss of Indiana Jones because with, you know, with expansion comes loss. But he also said, hey, this Indiana Jones franchise, we're going to expand on that too. We're going to continue to, I don't even want to say necessarily revive another 20, is it 20 years old, 30 years old? I don't want to feel like I'm old. But it's a franchise that I still think has relevance, however old that original Raiders of the Lost Ark is. Who would like to see some Indiana Jones come back to the parks? <laughs> right, the Indiana Jones adventure in Disneyland is still incredibly popular. That is I know it's sort of I know it's Dinosaur ride. Plus, but it's much better there. Oh, than, it's, right. it's Dinosaur Plus Plus Plus. plus. That, that is an amazing ride out there, and it, it really it draws you into the story, again, that you don't really get to see out here. So I would love to see that here. I would love, would you like to see that same ride or something completely different in the Indiana Jones oh, something universe? something different. I would like to see something different. I, I'm a proponent of having different experiences on different coasts, so you can go to California Adventure and experience something that you'll never experience over here, so you really do get that opportunity. Right, I don't want Cars those. Land here. Yeah. Like, who would like to see Cars Land built at Hollywood Studios? Keep those hands down. A couple. Oh, well, there's a few. Don't you want to go to Disneyland? What? what, what? 
<laughs> what, what are you, why are you saying no? Hold on. Disneyland is far. It's far to travel. Look, once you're on a plane, it doesn't matter where you're going. A couple of hours, you watch the movies, and, and you're good to go. But I agree. I would like to have unique experiences on each coast rather than yeah. sort of replicating things from... There's a, a, a pass hour in the corner okay. with a hand raised. I really... Speaking of new lands, what do you really think about the Avatar land coming to Animal Kingdom and how well that's going to go over? All right, I'm standing up and taking the glasses off. Oh, here we go. For impact. So when they announced Avatar Land, which it's not called Avatar Land, but for argument's sake, when they announced the, the partnership with James Cameron, I was shocked at what I saw online. Hey, believe it or not, there's some angry people online, um, especially, prote- <laughs> especially protected by that veil of anonymity on Twitter, and, and you get a lot of keyboard courage when your name is Goofy Dude 77 <laughs> But people lost their minds. They said, oh, I'm never going to Avatar Land. I can't believe they're doing this. It's going to be stupid. I have no idea. And I was like, wait a minute. You haven't seen any concept art. They haven't moved one stitch of dirt. You have no idea what it's going to be other than that Disney is partnered with probably one of the other greatest storytellers and filmmakers in in modern times. The Avatar movie made a couple of bucks. And you forget, and there's a great article on, on CNN, that when Avatar came out, People were so enamored with this film that they were, their one complaint was they wanted more. They wanted to be immersed in this land of Pandora. They wanted to go to the place that they saw in the film. Who better than Disney than to bring that land to life? Look, I, I love this company, shocker of all shockers, right? I think that they've earned my trust in the past however many decades. So when they say that they're going to build a world based not on the story of Avatar. It's not about Marines with guns and and that. It's about the message of what that film I think was about, but more importantly, it's about taking that world where I picture nighttime and animal kingdom with bioluminescent plants and ground that sort of lights up when you walk on it and flying dragon thingies in the air and oh, the restaurant possibilities and the, (laughs) so I'm excited about that. I don't think anybody's crying that Camp Minnie Mickey closed, other than maybe Scott, right? (laughs) That land was meant to be temporary from the day it was put in there. And so to me, and I do get sort of, and I get frustrated because when I see such adamant animosity towards something that they haven't seen yet, it it kind of surprises me. Um, I think about what the possibilities for that land may be and what the possibilities for Disney's Animal Kingdom are. We have already seen that the plan is now to make, this is, look, this is not just going to be a nighttime park, this is going to be the nighttime park. This is where you're gonna spend your nights, is gonna be at Animal Kingdom. And when the world of Pandora opens, because it's not Avatar Land, when the world of Pandora opens in a couple of years, I, I think and I hope and I believe in my heart of hearts, a lot of those naysayers will hopefully be, be not, I don't want to prove them wrong, I hope that their opinions will change when they see what they're about to put together. So. Well, we're not hearing a lot about that right now, though, because it seems like the moment that they said the word Star Wars, we kind of lost what was happening with Pandora. So what's Well, happening? I think what's happened, because I get emails every week that says, are they really still building Avatar? I heard they're not doing it anymore. They canceled the project. Joe Rody gave I'm like, what? I'm like, the problem with, and it's not the problem, is that you can't see it. Yeah. Right, Because of the big green, you know, don't look here, walls are up, you don't see the physical construction going on, so it's hard to get excited, as opposed to a Seven Dwarfs mine coaster, where you watch that thing right. come up out of the ground. We had two years to get excited about that attraction. Here, it's behind a wall, so we don't know what's going on, so it's sort of easy to kind of forget. And they also didn't release concept art, so right. they weren't sort of teasing a lot. And I, look, I say every year at the end of the year recap and the beginning of the year show, the thing that I'm most excited about are the things that we don't know yet. Exactly. And that is what sort of gets me going about Avatar is that, you know what, when we start to see some of this stuff come out, I, I think we're going to be very excited. You know, in a way, you just talked about Mind Train for a second. We knew what was coming. We saw the concept art. I found it very intriguing that the walls had windows. So you could actually see the construction. And from my experience at Walt Disney World, that's the first time I've ever seen that. But that whole excitement, especially with Cars Land, when we knew what was coming, we saw some concept art, but we didn't really see what was happening except for, oh my gosh, there's mountains that are coming up online. It was kind of better not to know. So that you get that first initial, oh my gosh, feeling when you saw it for the first time. Well, I think there's something cool about 
being allowed to peek behind the curtain, yeah. right? The archives have started to do that. D23 has done, I think, a really good yeah. job of letting us do that. You get just a good enough peek to sort of whet your appetite. So I like the idea of putting, look, if you don't put the windows, it doesn't matter because somebody's going to go up to the Columbia Harbor House right. with their, you know, their super telephoto lens and be taking pictures of the construction anyway. Right. Let the kid that can't go, or the kid or the person who's vertically challenged, look <laughs> through a window and see once they get a certain, to a certain point yeah. what's coming. You want to talk about a, a, an, a, an ongoing coming attraction movie that's sort of going on? That's what that did. Mm -hmm. That told people who were here, like, oh my God, we need to come back here in two years when this attraction opens. Who's ridden Mine Train? Wow. Love Mine Train? Don't love Mine Train? Give me a sort of a... Love it. Anybody not love it? Anybody? You can say it. It's okay. We, get a, we got a couple of, eh? A couple of, eh? Um, it's what? It's too short. I'm too short of them, or the attraction is too short. <laughs> and, I think you, and, and I think for a lot of people, they feel that. But you have to understand something, too. And when you look at the attraction and the relatively small footprint that Imagining had to work with, we know that a lot probably got cut out. Right? They probably they, they said, the Imagineers, Diego Paris, we wanted to make the attraction longer, but you had a very limited amount of space to work with. You also have to make an attraction in Fantasyland that not only I'm going to love and the hardcore you know, fan is going to love, but those attractions, especially in Fantasy, Fantasyland, are not made for the, you know, the 46-year-old hardcore Disney geeks. They're made for these kids. Right? They're made for the people who are, you know, the, the, the target are people in Fantasyland that want to ride with their kids and want to ride with their families. And what I love about Mind Train is that to me, the first time I wrote it, A, I had a smile on my face the whole time, right? Which to me is, is the hallmark of a good attraction. I felt the same way about Radio Springs Racers. And I think that Mind Train is like a three act play, right? That first part of the attraction, you're enjoying that sort of swaying of the coaster, you're looking around, you get beautiful vistas of fantasy land, and then act two is when you go inside and you get that classic dark ride. And I loved the rearrangement of the music and the animatronics and the projections. And then you come out and that third act is that combination of Big Thunder Mountain meets Expedition Everest, and there is a little bit of, of a thrill ride aspect to it. And then you get the payoff at the end. You get that final scene with the cottage and Snow White and the dwarfs, and you get that little homage to the original attraction. I think it is sort of that complete experience. And when you look around and you watch kids coming off and their eyes are wide open and they're trying to run back online, which as you can see can get very, very long, I think that, you know, in, in my book, I think that's a home run kind of attraction. You can't make an e-ticket thrill ride in Fantasyland, right? You can't make something that's going to be like a, you know, a space mountain in Fantasyland because you want, Walt wanted families to ride together, and I think that's what Mind Train does. I think it gives families a, a, a thrilling coaster. It's not quite Barnstormer. It's not quite Expedition Everest. It's somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. yeah. So somebody mentioned, we were talking about things like um, Star Wars coming to the parks, Indiana Jones coming to the parks. Um, let's talk Frozen for a second. Who has seen what they've done over at Disney's Hollywood Studios? A lot of hands. Who has waited online to meet Anna and Elsa? <laughs> Who has waited more than one hour? Who has, of course, Beatrice is going to keep her hand up. Who has waited more than two hours? Who has waited more than three hours? And Beatrice Feeney still really? has her hand up. Four hours. Somebody te right, teach her about Fast Pass Plus. She <laughs> clearly did not get the memo. This is called a magic band. And there's an but we laugh, band. we laugh, but... You know, from the time that they first showed up in Norway for this limited time magic run, and lines were five and six hours long, I, I still think it's funny that a parent walks up and it's like, yeah, five hours, let's do this. This is an <laughs> awesome idea. Let's go wait to meet Anna and Elsa. Let's spend That's... half our day to meet. I've never seen that anywhere no. with any other characters. I haven't either, but you remember when they were showing us at D23, and they showed us the pictures, and they showed us the concept art, and they showed us this wonderful thing called Frozen, and half of the room was just kind of like, oh, that's, a, that's an okay thing. I mean, you kind of had that at first in. I was so meh. I sat there, and I went, this is the next Lion King. I, I just had that feeling to me, because the, the thing for me, and I don't know if you agree, but it has an element that we haven't seen in any other Disney movie, which is sisters. 
and the relationship between sisters, and a man didn't have to save them. It was women who, girl power. I was gonna say, all the girls were like, yeah, <laughs> it was girl power. And like it, singing girlfriend. <laughs> no, it was. And so I think part of that is why it resonates so much because we've never seen that before. In, in any, it's always Prince Charming comes to save her and whisk her off or you know, uh, different types of mother-father fa- type family stories, but never sisters. I don't think, and, and having spoken to people at the, I don't think anybody saw Frozen coming. I don't think anybody saw, I don't think that they was like, you know what, we don't need to make that much merchandise. Nobody's really yeah. gonna be all that into that movie. Otherwise we would have seen it th- a right. week before the movie came out. I was, admittedly, I was confused. Cause seriously, when you saw the first trailers for Frozen, think back, who thought it was a movie about a snowman and a moose or whatever that thing, or a reindeer? Right, it, you said it was a horrible. Right. Right. Twelve seconds. So Mark said the second, the, the first proper trailer had twelve <laughs> seconds of Elsa. I will take. Can you do that again? Just because it was so proper trailer. Proper trailer. And, and neither Anna or Elsa were named in the ever. ever. Right. And we Olaf didn't know what the movie was about. And a half. Right. So I first saw it and I was like, oh, this must be the short in front of the film, because I thought this was supposed to be like the Snow Queen, and I was like, oh, maybe it's not. It's a movie about a snowman and a reindeer, and some sort of like, it's like a buddy cop movie, but in the snow. But when I saw the film, and I watched how my kids reacted, and you're laughing, and you're crying, and I walked out, and I was in downtown Disney, and as I'm walking out, I'm downloading the soundtrack, because I was blown away. And I thought the film was visually stunning, Mm -hmm. but I think what it was was, it's almost less about the, the sisterhood relationship, girl power thing, than the hallmark of any good Disney film. The classics, right? right. The Lion Kings, the Beauty and the Beast, the Little Mermaid is what? It's the music. Yeah. It's absolutely music. And it was stunning. It was it, right. Amazing. And the fact that everybody on the planet knows let it go. <laughs> and do you want to build a snowman? Like, that is what, when it sort of transcends the Disney fans going to see the films because we love it, that is what is sort of, I think, ushering potentially the next renaissance of Disney animation. Because if you look, it used to be that Pixar was the ones who were hitting it out of the park time after time. Now it's becoming Disney. It's Disney animation. More importantly, not just Disney animation, I think Marvel is the new Pixar. Oh, wow, yes. Like, (laughs) Guardians of the Galaxy... Like, you are really on this movie. Am, you are you've not been just, glowing about it's it. It's not just me. Who Come on, who loved Guardians of the Galaxy? It's really that good. It, it, who downloaded Awesome Mix Volume 1? Ooga chaka, ooga chaka. Like, that's all no, I sing in the car no, hold right on. now. Is, is that because it's, it's music of the, child, of the children of the 80s, no. us that grew up in that, really? When, like Frozen, okay. when I saw the, the trailer for the first time, I was like, yikes. <laughs> I thought it was going to be hokey. I was like, this is campy. Yes. Like, oh my God, they're like trying to make like a kiddie superhero movie. Most of us probably didn't know who the Guardians of the Galaxy were. And I may have said this before, even in the trailer, John C. Riley's character was like, who are these people again? Like they even, they sort of put themselves in the position of the audience. Like even we don't know who these characters are. It's not like they are the Avengers. We well, yeah, all you, know who Iron it's, Man it's, is. It's a tree and a, and a raccoon. And well, I, from looking at it. Be careful, girlfriend. Don't just be careful. <laughs> I'm treading on the I Guardians, will tell you apparently. At that, and, and I don't care. I cried in the first five minutes of that movie. Right? Like, I cried at the beginning of the movie, I cried at the end of the movie, and I laughed the entire time the rest of it. Wow. Like, it was that popcorn, and I don't, and I'm analogizing, I'm not comparing, it was like Star Wars. It was that same kind of like, this is just awesome, and it's fun, and I can't wait to go see it again. Wow. Yeah, it says a lot. It does say a lot because, and look at, again, look at the history of what Marvel has been doing oh. in terms of Avengers, Iron mm-hmm. Man, Winter Soldier, like, right? Anybody love Winter Soldier? They are just consistently, yeah, we need to get you a DVD player. Um, <laughs> they are consistently doing well. I would love to see more Marvel coming into the parks. And I understand yes. the contractual limitations of it, but I wonder 
if that will potentially change in the future. I would hope so, because what I love so much about the Marvel franchise in, in the movies is how they tie all of them together. So once you have committed yourself to loving a character... Hail Hydra. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Once you've committed to loving a character, you've got to then, like Iron Man, if you connect to Iron Man, then you've got to see the Avengers because he's part, an integral part of, of that. And then I remember you were telling me um, with Winter Soldier not to watch the beginning of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. until I saw Winter Soldier, which of course I totally didn't listen. But <laughs> it, it's so neat how all of these little pieces of the franchise are tying together like a little puzzle. So you really do immerse yourself into these characters. I think whoever has been doing the marketing for the films, especially with things like Guardians of the Galaxy and, Thor. and, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Captain America. And oh, Thor. Calm down, ladies. <laughs> and Thor. And Thor. <laughs> They, and look, if you are in this universe, then you need to go see Guardians of the Galaxy and go, oh my God, I see what they did with, you know what I'm talking about. And then stay to the end. You know oh, you, you have to stay until the end. Anything that Marvel does, you have to stay until right? the cr- Like people leave the theater, I'm like, what are you people doing? It's a Marvel movie. You don't leave now. What you don't leave stuff? at the credits. I was going to say, in, in Avengers at the very end where you stay through the end of the credit and they eat, they're eating what? Shawarma. See, I don't even know what that is, but I want it. Because I saw it. I go to Tangerine Cafe and I'm like, I'll have the Avengers platter, please. And they're like, what? <laughs> and you know, that was a total throwaway. They had to reshoot that after really? the film was over. Yeah. Uh, the trivia. Wow. I, I, wrote a book. I learned I something too. today. He has a beard. And see, I teach my, my kids Ooh. well. So in terms of ter- bringing this back to the Disney parks, mm-hmm. we're certainly going to see more Star Wars. We're going to see more Indiana Jones. You wonder if that franchise is going to be rebooted like some of the other things are. I think it's a no-brainer. Look, Bob Iger said it well. He said, he, like, the one thing about all these films and how well they're doing is they own the rights to them all. Right. They don't need to license from anybody. Well, that takes us, circles of us back to the Marvel situation because we do know that there's a licensing issue, anything that is east of the Mississippi. So it's most likely that we would see something in California before we would see something here. In Shanghai. And yeah, and sh- right. oh. That means we have to go on a research trip to Shanghai, don't we? Did you see the concept art for the oh, Stark amazing. thing that they're building out there? Uh, you can't go. There's an age, there's an age <laughs> limit. limit to you need to be 35 before they're, you're allowed in Shanghai. <laughs> but that has a lot of really cool potential too for what they can do with the Marvel Universe depending on what's available legally and wondering where they would put it. My question, and I want to hear your guys' opinion on this because I've heard arguments both ways. Frozen is still pop. Anna and Elsa still have five-hour waits. Good luck getting yourself, getting your hands on an Olaf plush, right? You're still waiting to get into Oaken's trade, wandering outpost trading zone thing. Rumors have been circulating for a long time about Frozen coming as a more permanent location at the Disney parks. If so, who would like to see more Frozen in the parks? Uh, by, uh, by applause for the people who are listening. Well, if it includes snow and ice 75% and coolness. 75% of you, right? Uh, should it be an attraction? Should it be a land? A land. You want to see, you want to see Arendelle come to the Disney parks. So here's, here's the $64,000 question. Kids, that was a fo- popular TV show back when. The $64,000 question is, where do you put Frozen, where do you put Arendelle? Norway. So I'm going to play devil's advocate. Right? No. Somebody says, no way to Norway. Wow. If you put Frozen in Norway, which sounds like it makes sense, do you now not compromise the integrity of what World Showcase was meant to be in terms of a, a showcase hmm. of the cultures? Because you're not taking over, you're not making it Caballero land. You're making, it, you're, you're making it characters who exist in the, in the real world of Mexico sprinkled into an attraction as opposed to we are now going to retheme Mexico to... Because there is no Arendelle. There's no Arendelle in Norway. Right, but you could, easily, you could easily take Maelstrom, which is a, a great attraction, but it's old, and retheme it with a frozen background. You still have your trolls. You still have your polar bears. You still have all the things that make it cool. And then leave the rest of Norway fairly intact. So would you object to mail? Because that seems to be what makes sense. 
Right. Karen Stoy says, no. Do you not, do you make, and make your arguments either way, do you do a, a frozen overlay to Maelstrom? If not, why? Um, I think it's going to be a people space issue. If you think of how small their footprint is in Norway, little Norway would get overrun and it would really, it would take away from the whole point of visiting that land would be. I know that you said that there's an extra space between Mexico and Norway. I know we may not see that. Oh, you do listen. I do listen, <laughs> but I just don't think it would be fair to that country to overrun it with Anna and Elsa. They need to plan for their own area. And once I saw cars land and then I saw Frozen come, it's a no-brainer. They need something like that in its own space. Right. Do you know one stat that we heard tourism-wise from the, the Norway Tourism Association is that once that uh, movie came out, tourism from the United States went up by 28% within the first 30 days. And Adventures by Disney has a yeah. Nor... I mean, they're like, hey, we got to hop on the Norway bandwagon. Yeah, and, and, they, and the cruise as well is going right. to Norway. So it, they really are... In fairness to the co the country, they're getting a lot of tourism from this movie. But I think at first people were thinking, we're going to go to Norway to the snow, when in fact it's not really that <laughs> in most of the season. Right, so he says that they still haven't updated the Norway film right. in decades. And I think the, the, the issue that comes, especially when you talk about World Showcase, is look, World Showcase was built like much of the Disney parks, going back to Disneyland, was built on sponsorship dollars. Pavilions only got built if they were able to be funded not just by Disney, but by the host country as well. So it's probably tough to go to a country like Norway and say, hey, you know what? It's been a while. We really think you guys need to update your film and spend millions of dollars to put this film in Walt Disney World that may or may not generate tourism. It possibly is a harder sell to a host country, and that, it's really not the host, other than Morocco, it's obviously not the host country, it's the corporations, right, that have to spend the money to do it. Um, so, I don't know, unless Sig Hansen and some of the other guys from Deadliest Catch want to sort of put some of their money into <laughs> investing, um, that maybe is where it would have to come from. Just to play devil's advocate, um, there is a little bit story integrity, you I don't know if Norway wants to be saying in their story that you're going to go to their land and see a talking snowman. And beyond that, um, Tony Baxter said on your show last week that there are great movies that have come out, you know, The Beauty and the Beast and, you know, Tangled, like, there are great movies. Tangled deserves more of an bathroom, so to say. And, you know, going back to the point about, you know, girl power and all that, Brenda Chapman created a great precedent with Brave, and maybe that deserves something more than just a parade float. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree. I, I think there are, but I think what happened, who can sing the theme from Brave? Practically nobody, right? Who can, can sing the theme from Brave? Practically nobody, and I think that was part of the problem, is that you might have liked the character, you might have liked the story, but you didn't walk away, and like, I need to download that, and I don't think Merida, certainly not as popular, I mean, Merida had her place, mm -hmm. Lines for Merida were never as long for lines for Anna and Elsa. So do you now maybe, is the answer to dedicate a section of Disney's Hollywood Studios, more importantly, do you try and find land in Fantasyland? Do you expand New Fantasyland even further to put another castle, to, to put an ice castle, and do you put, you know, the, one, two, the fourth castle in Fantasyland and build Arendelle there? I think you can pretty much keep the integrity of Norway while incorporating Frozen, Whereas, all right, if you're gonna retool the ride for Frozen, okay, that happens, it happened with El Rio del Tempo. But uh, as far as uh, you can take Akashus and you can change it to a, to a Frozen meet and greet uh, for, for a meal and everything. And also, while the World Showcase was designed to be one thing, Disney World is always changing, and that's Walt's idea too, that it's always being reimagined. They reimagined the wonder because it wasn't working at one point to switch it, around, switch it around at times, that's just the nature of this company. It's always changing. And to sort of further that argument, you know, when World Showcase was originally being designed, uh, there were actually plans to have attractions based on classic Disney stories. So there was supposed to be a Pinocchio-themed attraction. There was going to be an Alice in Wonderland area and land in the UK. And then the shift changed. They said, no, we, what, we want this to be a sort of a more permanent World Showcase kind of idea. So it could, but now all of a sudden people are like, well, we need to have an Alice in Wonderland ride in the UK. We need to have a Pinocchio. I mean, there was going to be a Pinocchio village uh, originally in Italy. Um, and certainly you know about some of the other attractions that were going to be in, in Japan and um, 
uh, and, and Germany, but they weren't based on intellectual property things. They were based still on those countries. So uh, I think it'll be, I think the next 18 to 24 months are gonna be very interesting in terms of what we're gonna see. And I think in terms of Frozen, I think we'll probably see something even sooner. I would expect Star Wars wise, I think next year at D23 Expo or Star Wars Celebration, which is a couple of months earlier out in Anaheim, I think that's when we're gonna get some more details uh, about what is coming. So, Is that gonna be a good excuse to get out of the booth to go see? I, look, the bottom line to me is that I still think it is a great time to be a Disney fan. Um, I think there's a lot of really exciting things coming. Um, I think that um, things that happen elsewhere in the theme park industry is good for everybody. Like everybody wins because we as guests are the ones who benefit mm -hmm. because the bar is continually being raised yeah. higher and higher. Good competition, and I don't mean from other companies, but even from Disneyland versus Disney World and how you ratchet it up definitely breeds great experiences in the end because everybody wants to outdo each other. So we'll win. Everybody wins. I agree. So uh, one question I get all the time, and this is where I want to hear you guys, as long as we're playing armchair Imagineers, and forget budget, forget any of that kind of stuff because it's only money, it doesn't matter. <laughs> We're talking about expanding and bringing new attractions, but a lot of us are nostalgics. Um, Scott Otis is nodding his head. So <laughs> let's sort of think forward, but think backwards. If you were the head of Imagineering and you have unlimited budget, and let's not worry about the technological hurdles, if you could bring back one Walt Disney World attraction, what would it be? Look at all the giggles. <laughs> Horizons, we're getting a lot of, raise your hand for Horizons. One, two, three, four, five, six, the original journey into imagination. Yes. Also, you change your mind. You're like, ah, forget Horizons. Horizons was so five minutes ago. It's journey to imagination. Original journey to imagination. So you want to see Dreamfinder Figment exactly the way it was. Wow. Same technology, same. You'll be happy with it. Open up the, who said that? Who said open up the, the, uh, the image works upstairs? That's the thing that I miss most. Right, we talk about the level of interactivity coming to a Disney attractions, which I think we're going to see even more so in the next few months. That it was sort of that digital playground that you were able to go to after you were sort of your appetite was wet about what you could do with your imagination. You could actually go and do it. I would love to see that come back because I think that, and I think you somebody talked about Tony Baxter being on, on the show this week, talked about how Dreamfinder and Figment were that perfect sort of comedic tag team that, you know, Figment and you were sort of learning about imagination together and he was taking you along, but there was a great sort of back and forth between the two. Has anybody read the, the new Figment comic book? The Dreamfinder and Figment comic book? So, I mean, I, I, for years ago, I was told that Dreamfinder is dead, like, and they never killed the character, but in their minds, Dreamfinder was dead and gone and never coming back. And I think the sense of nostalgia that we've seen over the past five to seven years is bringing him back. And I wonder, you know, what the possibilities are of maybe not the original attraction, but that pair coming back. The comic book was certainly a cue that somebody's thinking about it. So I'd love Look, to see it. Look, they brought back the orange bird. Yeah. You know. <laughs> it is so true. <laughs> Too much, much to your delight. Him, right, they literally found him in a drawer and were like, yeah, let's bring, and now like orange bird merchandise is flying off the shelves. And of course, Figment has always been just the love, even though it didn't have a huge stage since I've been right. visiting Disney World. It's still very popular, and it's one of the things that people clamor to and, and connect to. So, And I think that you could reimagine imagination and make Figment and potentially Dreamfinder relevant and popular again. Oh, yeah. Not just to us, the geeks who remember him from 1983, but to these kids who've yeah. never seen him before and have no idea what we're talking about when we're like, Dreamfinder, and they're like, who? The creepy guy in the purple with the beard? And they, yeah, like I think you could sort of reimagine them and bring them back. Yeah, well, even a lot of the kids that, that we've seen, and, and your kids in particular as well, I remember you know, once they were even smaller than they are right now, they really associate with Figment. They yeah. really do attach to that character, and it's, it's got that childlike wonder and everything that we should hold on to as adults. He was, he, kids, to put it relative, he was the Duffy Bear of our generation. There you go. So. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. You have a question? Something like, where they make a big deal out of it, and then it's really not what most people expected. I think that 
part, I think part of the brilliance is not showing us too much yet, right? Don't start showing us concept art yet and making us think about it for two years. I think part of what appeals to me is the secret because our expectation levels are all over the board, right? I have high expectation levels because of what they've done in the past and what I think the, where the technology is going to grow. Did anybody, and I know it was, it was, it was a one night, one shot, did anybody see either in person or the video of the dragon flying over wow. Fantasyland? That was amazing. I was there, and I'm gonna tell you, a dragon flew over Fantasyland. Yeah. It flapped its wings, it shook its tail, and it breathed fire. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. Like, we've just seen the first beta version of what I was like, I can imagine seeing. Imagine those flying overhead in Pandora. That's... Yeah. I remember that night when we looked up and we could hear it first before we actually saw it. And there was rumor, everybody kind of talked about that we would see a dragon and you could hear it and then all of a sudden you heard the flapping sound and you looked up and one person looked up and then all of a sudden there was like 100 people all looking up with their mouths just agape of, oh my gosh, the possibilities. Because everything that we see, no matter what park you go to, yeah. no matter wh how great the technology is, everything is attached to something. Right. Every movement, every character, every attraction is grounded somewhere. This was a free moving, a free roaming. It was like Lucky the Dinosaur sprouted wings yes. and just took off. Yeah, that's a great way to put it because he, he had nothing attached. Like you said, right. he could land right in front of us and breathe fire and take off again. It was that real, it felt that real. I think, um, I think what's coming is that our experiences in the next five years are going to change dramatically. Yeah, I bet. Not just in terms of what we see and what we passively experience, but what we are able to sort of contribute to the story. We, are, I think, are going to start to direct attractions. You do it now in story time with Belle, yeah. right? That attraction is different every single time because you, are, you have the human factor. Right. You don't know what the, what the unknown element is, what your kid is going to do when he becomes part of that show. Or and what your husband what... is going to do when he's having to dress up in the, <laughs> in the suit of armor. Exactly. That's really cute. So. so, well, let me ask you a question because you asked them, with, especially with Star Wars in particular, what do you want to see? You're supposed to put the dream sequence music. Yeah. <laughs> I envision... You know, this guy. Look, I'm a, um, I'm a Star Wars purist. I was uh -huh. talking about this the other day. I remember being at Middlesex Mall in 1977 with my parents, sitting like six rows in the front because the theater was so packed, and sitting down at the end, and my dad and my mom were there. And when that Star Destroyer came on that screen for the first time, my dad and I looked at our, each other and we're like, oh, <laughs> like, oh, I can't believe what... And the first thing you wanted to do was, and somebody said it before, you wanted to go down to Tatooine. You wanted yeah. to eat at the, at the Moss Eisley Cantina. You wanted to interact with those characters. I think you can create a land where Tatooine exists and there's this giant Millennium Falcon in Docking Bay 94 and there's stormtroopers there. And, it, and we're seeing a little bit of that. Did anybody do the Star Wars character breakfast at uh, Hollywood Studios? Like, there was something really neat about trading with Jawas and seeing store troopers come by. And I was like, man, you put this in a more permanent location and you have, you know, bands in the cantina and you have some other... I think that's sort of the place that kind of makes most sense because even for those kids who are growing up on episode one, two, three, um, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that, but the, Tatooine is sort of the common thread, mm -hmm. right? Because Coruscant becomes a city... Um, Naboo, nice, but I, I think if you want to sort of appeal to the 1977 people right. and the, the new, next generation and wondering where, look, things, I think Star Wars Rebels is going to be the thing that reignites this franchise. I think some people adopted Clone Wars and they, and they liked it. I didn't sort of latch on to it, but I saw the trailer for Rebels and I'm like, I'm all in. Like, sign me up. Yeah, and Tatooine kind of helps you bridge the gap between one, two, three, four, five, six. That's yeah. kind of the crossroads of the two stories as well. So, yeah, it, I would love to walk into that cantina. I, I was that kid as well that looked at it and went, Ugh. and I know you're going to say, yeah, it's because there's booze there. I know, but that's not the case. It was because it, just all the different characters and the music, and I can still, I remember that feeling of seeing that for the first time and all of the different characters come to life on a screen that I had never seen before. It would be neat to walk into that environment. 
Yeah, great. All right, so how are we doing on time here? Because I know it's 4.58. You can talk for like 15 more minutes. Look at you. All right. So I have all kinds of ideas that I want you guys to contribute to. Christy says, it's 5 o'clock somewhere. Let's have a drink. Oh, what does that mean? Oh, excellent. It's fi fireball at five? See, what is I, it? What is I can actually read no. that. Oh, I wasn't supposed to read this out loud. No. Sorry. No. Do you need... Sorry. I think he needs some help with this. With what? The first one or the second no, one? No, you, first you work on the first one. Keep, keep going. Because then we five, get to the ten. second one. 5'10". Don't... don't. <laughs> Ask me to remind you. See what we have to deal with on a daily basis. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we have 10 minutes. All right, so we have 10 minutes. Let's ask it, another question. Let's do a top 10. Oh, Who wow. likes the top 10 segments? <laughs> all right, so I want you guys to be part of a completely, as all top 10s are, unscripted and unplanned top 10. Uh, I'll either throw out an, a topic or who wants to and I throw out an idea for a top 10 we're going to do right now, and you guys are going to be part of it. Got one. Go ahead and go. Is this about Pandora again? Top 10 Star Wars what? Top 10 Star Wars, anybody else? Han Solo. Top 10, go ahead. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> Ideas of something for the new Soaring. Ooh. Top 10, so who would like to see Soaring? All right, uh, here we go. Good. Top 10 attractions that you'd like to see updated. Mm. All right? So, okay, Fancy Pants, you said Soren, so you're gonna go first. Who would like to, a quick show of hands, who would like to see Soren updated? Wow. I'm gonna play devil's advocate. You still have probably the most popular attraction in Epcot with really, really long lines. From a business perspective, do you really need to update it? But okay, I'm playing devil's advocate. You wanna see Soren updated, give her the mic, Dougie Fresh. Wow, that's an obscure 80s. Kind of, yeah. Sorry. Okay, how would you like to see Soren updated? Um, I would like to see sites from around the world. Okay. So Great it should be Soren around the world. Stuff like that. Okay. The one place that Soren around the world has to go by is? Uh, Great Wall of China. Nice. Maybe. Hmm. That's going to be a long segment. <laughs> no. It's like, like a, it's a big wall. Pyramid to Giza? India? Uncle Wat? Maku Piku? Yeah. But if they're going to do it, they should do it right and randomize it so that, just like Star Tours, that you can go on. Oh, and do look at you. Imagineer for the day right really there. Really smart. Yeah. Randomize Soren. So it just cut, is it cut scenes or is it one day you go on, it's China, the next day it's India, the next no, cut, day it's... Cut scenes, like Star Tours. Okay. So you don't have to necessarily, like Soren is now, you're not connecting from one place right. to another. Every ride you get three different places, or four different places, whatever it is. Nice, wow. Oh, who'd you get? Oh, I got Greece, what'd you get? I got Italy. Oh, I got Cleveland. <laughs> that, that, that'll extend those lines to a five hour wait, <laughs> because yeah. you'll want to do it five or six times. Interesting, yeah. Interesting. I, I, the randomizing yeah. of Soren. All right, next attraction, top 10 attractions that need to be updated, Jimmy Styles. The great movie ride. Oh. oh. Yeah, right, hallelujah so, for that. All right, we, we, we did a segment on this on the show, and we talked about this at length. There is certainly an argument to be made for updating the great movie ride. The question we run into is how? Like, what films do you now put in there in order to update the great movie ride? There's, I mean, what's, okay, scene by scene, what's the musical? Don't say a high school musical, <laughs> please. All in this. Frozen, well, was Frozen a musical? I, like, Greece. Who said Greece? I put in. Oh, I mean, you know some of those words from that song. Or from, I know all the words from this song. Come on. And if somebody didn't have their phones, out, I'd be lightning. doing the hand jive. Go anyway. Grease Lightning. I'd, I'd almost say like you kind of already have a musical in there, being Mary Poppins. Right. Mm. So you can put something else into the musical space that's already there. All right, I'll make it easy. I'll make it easy for you with a hard question. You. You need to obviously have a, a number of different genres represented. The comedy genre needs to be represented, I think, in animatronic form. What film do you put in there? Anybody? What did you, you say? Yeah. Ghostbusters. <laughs> of course you did. But how relevant is Ghostbusters to them? It's, we would still laugh. All right, so she said, so what movie do you put in there for a comedy in, in, 
and, it, and there is no necessarily right answer because it's hard, right? You can't put in something that's a little more on the adult side. You got to put something that's going to... If somebody eventually comes up with one, bark it out or tweet me because I've never, nobody's ever been like, here is the quintessential wow. comedy that needs to be in the comedy section. Charlie Chap, my kids have no idea who Charlie Chaplin is. So, but you run into the same problem. You're mm -hmm. complaining that that great movie ride is not relevant and updated and now you're going back even further. You might as well tell them Busby, Busby Berkeley because they're, who? Right, but, and I think that's part of the problem. But, but how do you, right, because they couldn't like, well, we just can't, let's just pretend comedies don't exist. <laughs> All right, so two attractions, Soar and a great movie writer. What else needs to be updated? Mm. Susanna Mitchell from Xanaland. Oh, no, never mind, you didn't, you were, you were. Let's take Autopia and make it a little more like Richard Petty. <laughs> All right, so Tomorrowland Speedway, formerly the Tomorrowland Indy Speedway, formerly the Grand Prix Raceway, should be more like Richard Petty. So you're saying it should be more of a thrill ride? Oh, sorry. A few more horses. Seven horsepower now, or seven miles an hour, it doesn't go very fast. Again, I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm not saying I disagree or, or agree, but that attraction is not built for us. That attraction is built for seven-year-old Lou Mangiello, who, like, when he couldn't reach the pedals and he's with his dad and he's driving, I'm like, oh my God, I'm driving on the speedway. Like, that was like a memory that 40 okay. years later, I still carry with me. Um, here's a question for you. Do you do a cars overlay? Jeez. Oh, Somebody said, of course. Because now all of a sudden, Tomorrowland's not tomorrow. I mean, not that that's very futuristic, but Tomorrowland's not Tomorrowland anymore. It's Carsland Jr. And then people go, oh, all we have is stupid Tomorrowland Speedway with cars on it, and they've got Radiator Springs racers. Okay. So, Speedway, Soren, great movie ride. Susanna Mitchell from Zanaland.com. Carousel of Progress. Carousel of Progress. Now, no, listen. And I don't want you to... Now you're messing with Sasquatch. No, no, listen. <laughs> All right. You can't change what's already there, but I think the final scene is supposed to be the future, which it obviously no longer is. I think that opening stage scene where you go in and there's just the sign, they need to turn that into the future for real. <laughs> nowadays, and then keep that one as like, you know, the 70s or 80s or whatever. But you can't, right? Because, all right, we're gonna, Susanna, we agree with you, we're gonna do it today. We're gonna put an iPhone S, and we're gonna put in this flat screen TV, and six fronts from now, people go, oh, remember how cute no. those iPhone S's used to be? You'll never, that's the problem with Tomorrowland, it. it's the at, problem with Epcot. Look at Guardians of the Galaxy, look at the technology that's in that movie. We don't look at that like and be like. Like A-track, like cassette players? <laughs> Aside from that. We you don't know that that's that. not really the future, right? Look, we know what the future looks like. It's Aaron Gray in white spandex, and that's what the future's all going to be. No? Really? Really. As a kid, that's what they told me it was going to be. <laughs> well, then put that in if that's what you want, if you're designing it. <laughs> but my but point I think is, that's the problem. You, think... can, you can do futuristic technology. And, I mean, honestly, World of Motion, the end scene of World of Motion, I think would hold up today as being future. And I think they could definitely do something like that. It would be difficult and a challenge, but that's what Imagineering is all about. It's more, almost more science fiction than science fact. It's sort of our vision, our sort of, you know, storified vision of, of the future. Right. Okay. It and eventually, it'll, and then it'll end up looking like 1977 again. So, all right, Carousel, I'm not disagreeing with you, although it is a bit of a snapshot in time. Ellen's Energy Adventure, I mean... I'm sorry, say again? Ellen's Energy Adventure. Ellen's Energy um, Adventure. I mean, oh, yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis and Ellen... Well, Ellen's still prominent in the public life, but I don't know how well the test of time is being held up for Jamie Lee Curtis and Bill Nye, the science guy. And on that same note, NLG is an important topic. It needs to be discussed. It's something integral to the message of Epcot and... It's a current hot topic that can be addressed in a fun but educational way to maybe inspire kids to do what it originally did, which is inspire people to try and solve that recurring problem that we run into. I mean, look, you know, the universe of energy has always had, you know, the problem is you're trying to make a pretty boring topic kind of sexy. Like, oh, we're going to talk about energy. Like, like, who wants to talk about energy for 45 minutes? I think it does it well. I think it's still kind of entertaining. Um, like, I go in. Like, my son used to love it because it had dinosaurs in it. I like it because it had Ellen in it. Um, I think it can. I, I agree. It probably could be updated in terms of, of 
how it is. Um, who would you like to see host it? Who's your host? I think that's not Justin really Bieber. He said Justin Bieber. No, well, whatever. <laughs> listen, whatever works for you, man. That, that's saying, cool. I'm, I'm saying that I don't think that that's the direction that needs to go in as a host. I think that the original attraction certainly had its, you know, sauces to it, and that there's a way to make old new again. But telling that story not necessarily with a, you know, a this name. Okay. All right. So we got. I think that's five. Let's keep going quickly. There's uh, Christy Visaki has Christy Visaki. A... Oh, here comes the teacher. Oh, no, given, given the popularity of Toy Story Midway Mania, I am shocked that Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin hasn't been updated because I don't know about anyone else, but no one in my family can figure out what they're shooting at. And the score just <laughs> seems to happen, and you're like, okay. And, you know, they obviously have the ability to do something far more <gasps> accurate that you can see what you're aiming at. And... Guardians of the Galaxy. I still want to yeah, drop the mic and just be like, walk off the this, stage, but the Disney guys would get so mad if anything. I did that. I, did you see the movie? Right? I didn't see the movie, but I don't understand. I know, but make that like a cool shooting Guardians oh, okay, of the Galaxy fine. attraction. Yeah. But yeah. It's just a little, it needs help. And I like the ones in Disneyland better because you actually move the gun around. All right, so quick, couple of quick attractions, go. Fantastic. Fanta Whoa, Fantasmic. That's a good one. The Wonders of Life Pavilion makes you sad. Okay, it... I, I still think there is a life and health pavilion that needs to fit there. I think, the insur I think a couple of insurance companies can get together and put something cool in there. From what I understand, they have a couple of bucks in the bank. I, I think there's a, a great opportunity to tell, you want to talk about telling an important story, especially for kids. Disney's very much on the health conscious kick. That's where it needs to go. Go Big Daddy. Stitch's Great Escape. Who doesn't love Stitch's Great Escape? <laughs> Stitch is great. So do you keep it Stitch, or do you update it to something? Keep it Stitch, but I don't think that it's really like a family experience. I think it's like a little more like, I think they're trying to keep it like the alien experience, but I... Bring back Flight to the Moon. Oh. Because I totally bought into the fact when I saw like the rocket flames on the bottom and the stuff on the ceiling, I was that we were going into space. So, All right. Lou, I have a question for you. No, no. I know. Every time I say that, it's always there's something coming in. No, seriously, I have a question for you because it's driving many people crazy. What is 103? Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> Do you guys care what 103 is? <laughs> Has anybody thought about what they think 103 is? Don't say anything. <laughs> Try kid. Who, who thinks they have an idea? Quick, 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 go. Go, go, go. It's what? Stay on Disney property. Staying on Disney property. Ways to save on a cruise. Ways to save on a cruise. Ooh. Interesting. Anybody else? Nope. Nothing. See, Nothing. they don't. They don't care. I will. I'll, I'll wait to announce it another time. Okay. If they... <laughs> no. Boo. Who thinks it's the one question that I forgot to add to 102? It is another time. There's a lot of time. <laughs> don't worry. Um, I will tell you what it's not. Uh, it is not an update to the book. It is not 103 Ways to Save Money at Walt Disney World. In fact, it's not a book at all. Ooh. Ooh. See, now uh. everybody was sleeping, they just woke okay, up, now right? now that they know that, so... So now that you know it's not a book, now what do you think it is? Nobody? It's an audio guide. It's a 103-minute audio guide. It's what? <laughs> an event. Interesting. Hmm. Beard. Hmm. Beard? You mean like, <laughs> when you say event, you mean like 103 maybe isn't a number. Maybe it's a date. people? Oh. It's October 3rd. Oh. <gasps> well, look, everybody's like grabbing their phones. Like, oh my God, what's October 3rd? <laughs> so again, who, what's up? What's going on? What's going on Ooh. around October 3rd? I know. Who said it? Nope. Nope. Tower race. Who's coming to do the tower race? <laughs> in, a, in a minute, She just I said, think. shoot, now I am. <laughs> so, look at me, girls. Does this look like I want to go start running in, in October? No. It has nothing to do... Well, that's not true. That's a bit, I'm lying again. 
It does have something to do with the tower race, but I promise you that running is not involved. Is it what? No, and again, it involves me getting up and running. Why do you want to be? So he just, he just was talked about doing something over at the tower itself. <laughs> her, bla- her brain's just fell off. You're so... Be afraid. <laughs> be very afraid. Um, so, no, you can't stay at the tower, which would be really cool. You can't stay overnight. But what if I told you that for a very small a very limited number of people, you could be a very special guest at the Hollywood Tower Hotel. Ooh. What if I told you... I'm sitting down. What if? <laughs> that late one evening... Dun, dun, dun. God, I hope it's a dark and stormy night. I'll be too. Um, <laughs> after the park is closed... And dun, everyone dun, dun. has left. You and a small group of friends will have a very special, I don't even want to call it cocktail party, a very special experience. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Up on the balcony of the Hollywood Tower Hotel. Yay! <laughs> but wait, there's more. This is the worst part, because I want to tell you, like, so much more of what's really going to happen, and I can't, yet. Aww. Not yet. I can't. I, I could. No. But you don't have to be stuck on a boat with Becky for four days, <laughs> so I can't. No. But what I can tell you is that on Friday, October 3rd, the night before, so it's cool, the Tower of Terror... 10 miler, 13 miler, I don't know, however many miles you people are gonna run. <laughs> we are gonna have a very special private party up on the balcony of the hot, it's never been done before. And we're gonna have a very special party up on the balcony of the Hollywood Tower Hotel. And that's all I could tell you now, other than that cooler. we will have details and then ticket information coming in the next couple of weeks. Um, pretty awesome. Who has ever been to, who came to our Adventurers Club event? Way back when we rented out the Adventurers Club in, in Pleasure Island. Who I came to there. our American Adventure event? The Adventure, who came to the great movie ride last year? Did you love that? Yeah. You're going to like this better. Yeah. I think you're going to like this. <laughs> you do not have to ride the elevator up or down. It has nothing to do with the... The uh, well. Stop! Ah. You, uh, do I need to take the Talk mic away later. from you right now? No. You do not have. To, it has nothing to do with riding the attraction. You do not have to ride the attraction to enjoy the experience. I don't know. Uh, uh, can, can you? Can you? Can you? <laughs> we said that at the same time. That was pretty cool. I just want a light, yeah. like under here, so it's like a. But of course, the really important thing, though, is it is a very small. Yes exclusive group. It's not going to be... And when we say exclusive, it's not like, oh, we only... It's because of the venue location. The space. It's a very small space, and we want to do something. You know, the great movie ride was big, and it was grand, and there was a lot of people there, which is cool, but I also like this, right? I like the intimacy of having a smaller group, and for what we're planning for that event, it needs to be something special, and I promise you, it definitely will be. Christy is saying, stop yeah. talking, you're, you're saying too much. What? <laughs> I don't have my glasses on. Oh, That's what all right, about. so who's excited for possibly coming to do a little tower, uh, a little checking in at the Hollywood Tower Hotel? <laughs> Woo. It's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be so cool. Come talk to me when Becky's not no. around. She's such a buzzkill. <laughs> We have um, ideas. All right, so we're almost out of time. Uh, we'll do one more question, simple question, just for everybody. Um, let's do something like favorite Disney... I talk about food, but it would be here forever. Favorite Disney character. Yeah. Who is your favorite Disney character and why? Like, make your argument for your favorite Disney character. 
Can I say figment? I mean, we did. Can you you can say figment. Because figment. Oh, good. She's got it. He's cute and purple. Go ahead. Favorite okay. Disney character. My favorite Disney character is a specific Mickey that um, it was the, when the Odyssey had the character show and he was dressed in the spaceship uh, uniform with the rainbow. That is my favorite Disney character. You're too young for that. How do you remember that? <laughs> well, I am too young for that, but hey, <laughs> it happens. See, and, that's what the future was supposed to look like: Mickey in silver sp- so spandex. Cute. Of it, but I'm really with rainbows, I can't see like we're all gonna have rainbows on our shirts. Erin Gray looked exactly like Mickey in, in that thing, too. Mine is Dumbo, by the way. Just mine is Tigger. Everybody says because I do so much, they don't know where I get my energy from, <laughs> and I'm bouncing from morning until night. I can go from six to midnight with nothing but like air. Starbucks, nothing but Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks works for me, Star- too. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, favorite character. My favorite is Elliot the Dragon. It's the very first Disney movie I ever saw, and I cried for weeks because I could not get my own dragon. And who didn't have a little bit of a crush on Helen Reddy? (laughs) It just got creepy, right? It got a little weird? Sorry. Pass hour. Br'er Rabbit. It's the first movie I remember seeing in the movie theater with my grandparents was Song of the South. And the fact that you are one of the few people here that actually has seen Song of the South. I Who have, has seen, who's seen Song I, of the South? Who's seen Song of the South legally? Uh-huh, see? Look at the hands can, that go I, down now. Can I change mine to Oswald? No, no, you cannot. <laughs> Come on. You are locked well, into that forever. Well, I love Stitch because he gets to do all the rascally things you wish you could do, and he gets away with it. That's why I like Stitch. Even when he toilet papered the castle? Everything he did, she wishes she could have done. A little bit of a rabble rouser at this table. <laughs> Anybody else? Come on, make your argument for the, the greatest Disney character. Like, Flick, because everybody thinks he's a lunatic and his ideas <laughs> actually work out and save the colony. Okay. That's a good Flick. one. You don't hear many people bring a Flick up. I dig that. Chip and Dale. Oh, you're going like a twofer. That's like a Lou Mangello answer. Two, <laughs> and two characters in one. Okay, well... Let's ask you. You, you who, who, my car- Listen, I, I'm, I, I'm a totally like a homer. I'm going for the easy one because my favorite character is without question, and I'm going to put my old recovering attorney hat on, without question, the greatest Disney character in, in history is Peter Pan. And here's why. He's a boy that never has to grow up. He lives on this beautiful Caribbean, I, I'm assuming it's a Caribbean, whatever. This beautiful island, <laughs> hangs out with his friends all day long, never has to grow up, fights pirates every day and wins. All the chicks dig him, right? Every girl's after him, the mermaids and Wendy and Tiger Lily. And he can fly. Oh, okay. Hello, he can fly. I can fly, Let's leave the tights out of it. And, and, another reason why? It's because he's here. Time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week. I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World history, see how well you pay attention to the details in what you see, or maybe even in what you hear, and then you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. Before we get to this week's question, let's go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So on the last show, I was talking with Tony Baxter, so I figured it was only appropriate that we have a Tony Baxter-themed question. So your challenge was to tell me, what was Splash Mountain originally going to be named and i gave you a hint as to where you could actually go back and find it on a previous show and again thanks to the hundreds of you that entered and got this one correctly because it was in fact going to be called the zippity river run and if you want to hear the story of how that name evolved to become splash mountain go back to ww radio show number 289 
my first interview with Tony Baxter, and he tells the story in his own words. Again, thanks to all of you who entered. Got this one correct. You are playing for all of my audio walking tours of the parks, a copy of my new 102 Ways to Save Money for and at Walt Disney World, and a mystery prize from my collection, which I've been putting up on eBay. I want to share it with others and make some space in my closet. So the winner last week, randomly selected from all the correct entries, is... Teresa Carey. So, Teresa, congratulations. Please send me your address. I'll send you out your prize package. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next opportunity to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So this week, I want to see how well you pay attention to what you hear in some of the attractions or shows as necessarily opposed to what you see. So tell me, where in the world can you hear this line? I don't think they'd notice a few extra bodies around here, if you know what I mean. All you need to do is tell me what attraction or show that is from. You have until Sunday, August 24th at 11.59 p.m. to email your answer to contest at wdwradio.com. This week, you're again playing for all the audio tours, a copy of my new book. We'll make the third prize a mystery this week. It could be a WDW Radio shirt. It could be a signed photo of Richard Sermon. It could be a mystery vinylmation or pin or something out of my collection. Who knows? But good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so very much for taking the time and tuning in this and every week. It has been an amazing couple of weeks with the cruise and podcast movement and getting to see and meet so many of you. So for that, I am incredibly grateful. Speaking of thanks, thanks to everybody who posted such kind reviews of my new 102 Ways to Save Money for and at Walt Disney World book over on Amazon.com, including Scott, Brian Harvey, D. Brinahill, Mary, Trent Weldy, and Barry Bellorio Jr. Thank you guys so very much. Again, to find out more about the book, you can go to Disney102.com. And don't forget to, if you bought a print edition from Amazon, you could also get the Kindle edition for just $2.99. Again, you'll find links to Amazon by visiting Disney102.com. Don't forget that in addition to the podcast, which you can find and subscribe over on iTunes, please visit www.radio.com. There we have multiple daily blog posts, contests, photo galleries, videos, newsletter, our iPhone app, and so much more. Also, please tune in every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern to WDWRadioLive.com, where I do a live video broadcast where you can be part of the show and the conversation by typing into the chat room. Again, that's WDW Radio Live every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Also, I love to connect and communicate with you guys any way that you like. So you can find me over on Twitter. I'm at Lou Mangiello, Facebook.com slash Lou Mangiello, or you can like the page over at Facebook.com slash WDW Radio. Please also comment on this week's show by visiting the show notes over at WDWRadio.com. And I'd love to hear from you directly. So if you have a question you want answered on the show, email me at Lou at WDWRadio.com or call the voicemail be heard on the air 407-900-9391 that's 407-900-9391 or leave a voicemail right from your computer by clicking on the leave Lou a voicemail button right in this week's show notes and as I say all the time because it is what I believe nothing beats a handshake and a hug please visit our events page got lots of events coming up including our meets of the month in Walt Disney World every single month the next meet of the month is probably going to be September 28th time and location to be determined. I'm also going to be doing a live broadcast the day before from the Disney Weddings live show. Again, you can find out more information on the events page. Quick thanks to everybody who came out to the meet of the month a couple of weeks ago over at the Boardwalk Bakery and everybody in and around the Texas area that came to our On the Road meet in Dallas right after the podcast meetup. Really was so great to see about 50 of you came out and had such a good time getting to meet and just sort of chat and watching you guys get to meet and make friends with each other. And to find out some other places that I'll be speaking around the country, please go and visit the brand new, recently relaunched, LouMangelo.com. You can also find out how to book me to speak at your conference, to your business, or to your school. And fellow podcasters, I have something special that we can do together just for you. So visit the website and check it out there. Uh, next on the road is going to be Cancun in September and then Florida Bloggers Conference also in September you can check, uh, again, LouMangelo.com for more information about some of those things I'll be doing as well. Also, stay tuned for some other events I'm going to be doing in and around Walt Disney World and other places around the country 
coming very, very soon. Quick thanks to my partners and sponsors. So as always, Mouse Fan Travel, my official and recommended travel provider. If you're going to World Land Cruise Adventures by Disney anywhere on the planet, Becky and her team of agents can help you get there for the best possible prices. All available discounts, all at no cost to you. Visit mousefantravel.com. And if you want some Disney magic delivered right to your doorstep and now your digital device, visit celebrationspress.com. And as always, my friends, and you are my friends, you continue to demonstrate that to me all the time. If you like the show, all I ask is that you please help spread the word. Let others know about it. Tweet out that you're listening. Share links and come by and comment over on Facebook. And please go review the show over on iTunes. Thanks to Mary LJ, JDib78, GGaz83, RSL, STLID, and Extant2 for their recent reviews over on iTunes. If you want to quickly go over and do it, you can visit www.radio.com slash review, and it'll take you right over there. And finally, and as always, most importantly, I need to say thank you to all of you for letting me do and share what I love with you through the show and so many other ways. You make every day for me feel like Christmas. I am excited about what I get to do, and it is all thanks to you. And I want you to feel the same way about whatever it is that you love and whatever it is that you want to do every single day. And the easiest way to start doing that is by changing how you think. Because a positive attitude, I promise you, leads to positive results. Go do what you love each and every day. You go be you. Have faith and always keep moving forward. Thank you again so very much. I hope you guys have an amazing week this week. So until next time, see ya. Hi, Lou. This is Kristen from Montreal, Canada. So, what do you like to eat in Quebec? It's poutine at Le Soleil. Why not? Have a good day, Lou. Bye. Hey, Lou. This is John from Essex in the UK. I'm here in Disneyland Paris waiting by the brand new Ratatouille adventure with Remy. Uh, the new ride, a whole new thing to area, uh, thing to Paris. Um, there's a two hour queue right now, uh, mayhem waiting for this ride. It's been so anticipated by everybody. And as soon as I finally got through this ride, uh, me and the family are going to have dinner at Shea Remy, uh, and it should be great. This place looks amazing. Anytime that you sit down to Disneyland Paris, I'll be waiting with a handshake and a hug for you. In the meantime, au revoir. Thank you, Sue and Perry. Bye-bye. Good morning, Lou Mangiello. It's Darlene Nagy from West Seneca, New York. I'm calling in to talk to the WDW Radio Box people, the WDW Radio group, and our WDW Disney Wonder Alaskan Cruisers. We are 285 days away, so... Start thinking what you're packing, and remember what I said, that our friends that went last year said it was unseasonably warm, so layers, 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 and I've seen Becky Mankin, and she said layers, too. So, just be prepared. Have a great day. It's going to be magical. It's nice and sunny here in Buffalo, New York. Bye. Bye.